We're learning cadaver dogs hit on 20 different locations during a search of the Fox Hollow Farm property over the weekend. Investigators now Hamilton are... County Coroner elect Jeff Jellison says there were approximately 25 bodies found in Westfield linked to Herb Baumeister in 1996. To say, I don't believe you, this isn't the person I know. This is not someone I have ever in my life seen yell to the point of slapping his children. I have never seen him throw anything. He has never even come close to even giving me a bruise by holding my arm. And you're trying to tell me he killed someone? It didn't add up. In December of 1994, a young 13-year-old Eric Baumeister was exploring the woods on his family's 18-acre estate. As he was exploring, he noticed something odd poking through the ground. It was a round, hard object. He stepped forward to take a closer look and was instantly shocked by what he discovered. He was looking at a human skull. The young boy immediately ran to the house, burst through the back door, and rushed to tell his mother. His mother, Julie, was shocked by what she was hearing. A human skull? In their backyard? In their quiet neighborhood? Behind their million-dollar house? There was just no way that was possible. Maybe it was just the remains of an animal that likely found its way onto their land and died. Julie followed her son over to the remains and was horrified to discover that her son was correct. This was a human skull. Not just a human skull. She uncovered a full, intact human skeleton. However, Julie chose not to contact the police. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Because initially, I was like, Julie, girl, be for real. But hear me out. Julie's husband, Herbert, was eccentric with a dark sense of humor. He had a ton of odd things in and around their home. There were mannequins placed in odd places, posed as if they were human. Herbert was obsessed with keeping things, so the house was cluttered and filled with boxes of his memorabilia. He was just odd and had odd interests in general. For all she knew, this could have been some weird prop of his. She decided to wait until her husband, Herbert, came home to ask him about the bones. My son and a friend of his had been walking in the backyard on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, he came to the back door and downstairs and said that he had found bones. And, and we went and looked, and they looked like human bones. There was actually a, a head or a skull or, or whatever um, around thing. And then there was a slight amount of... Um, of other bones there as well. Herb wasn't home when he came home. I took him out and I said, look at this, you know, and he said, oh, those are the bones that, you know, that were in the garage that were dad's. When Herb offered his explanation that they were ones that his father had had in medical school uh, and been out in the garage, I really didn't question that. Herb saved everything. Nothing was ever thrown away. That's where he said they came from. He would clean them up. The next time I went out there, within a week, they were gone. I really didn't think a lot more about it. For most people, Herbert's answer would not pass the litmus test. But for Julie, given what she knows about Herbert, it was believable. Little did Julie know, at the same exact time that she found the bones in her backyard, Indianapolis PD was piecing together a trail of missing men in the area. It would be another year and a half before authorities would discover the truth. Herbert was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on April 7th of 1947. He was the oldest of four children born to Herbert and Elizabeth Baumeister. 
His father was an anesthesiologist and provided a comfortable middle-class lifestyle for the family. Herbert seemed just like any other kid in his age group. Well, that was until he began to reach puberty. During this time, things started changing with Herbert's behavior. It was very clear that he was just different from the other kids his age. He was unusual. He had very odd interests, and he was very open about these interests. His friends mentioned that he would play with dead animals and would sometimes spark conversations about odd topics like death or drinking urine. There was even a rumor that he once urinated in a teacher's desk. Herbert was intelligent and he did well in school, but he was disruptive in class. Teachers would catch him making odd remarks or telling strange macabre jokes. This behavior eventually caught his father's attention. It was more than just a little odd, it was disturbing, and he wasn't sure what to do. I mean, could you imagine? When you hear that your kid is misbehaving, you expect to have to correct behavior like talking back, not following directions, or poor grades, but this? This was unheard of. Nevertheless, his father did the right thing and sent young Herbert to be mentally evaluated. When the results came back, Herbert was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and schizophrenia. Unfortunately, it is unlikely that he ever received treatment after this evaluation. As a teenager, Herbert's odd behavior persisted. On the surface, it was off-putting. He did his best to try to fit in by being more talkative and outgoing, but this just had the opposite effect on people. He made everyone around him uncomfortable. People with antisocial personality disorder tend to have trouble reading people's emotions. A person who does not suffer from this disorder would be able to understand that what they say or do makes people uncomfortable and they would stop doing whatever it is that makes people uncomfortable. But since Herbert did not have the ability to understand this, he continued his odd behavior until he ended up completely isolated from other kids. After high school, Herbert attended college at Indiana University in 1965. He was very intelligent, but for some reason, he just could not keep up with the work that was required to stay on track and finish school. He dropped out after only one semester. He tried a second time at the same school in 1967 after some pressure from his father, but dropped out again. After this, he tried a third time, but at Butler University, and he had the same result. He only lasted one semester before leaving the school as well. During his brief stint at Indiana University, he met his future wife, Juliana. They saw each other as the perfect partner. They were both wholesome, entrepreneurial, and held the same conservative values. So, in 1971, after Juliana graduated, they decided to get married. Their marriage started off rocky. Herbert did not seem to want to be intimate with Juliana. It was a few months into the marriage before they even consummated the marriage. Not too long after that, Herbert seemed to be having a mental breakdown. Julie claims that he just seemed stressed or like he needed rest. He was dealing with a lot of change all at once, which can be overwhelming for some people. Then, six months into the marriage... For unknown reasons, Herbert's father had him committed to a mental institution where he stayed for two months. Despite this, their marriage persisted. In an interview, Julie described their marriage as being one of family love. They didn't do romantic things. In fact, they only had sex six times throughout their over 20-year marriage, which was just enough to create their three kids. While this may sound odd to many people, it felt very normal to Herbert and Julie. After his stay at the mental hospital, Herbert tried to build a career for himself. His experience trying to incorporate into the workforce was very similar to his experience in school. He just could not fit in. There are some people who are okay with being a loner, but Herbert was not one of those people. He wanted to fit in with people. His father managed to get Herbert a job working at the Indianapolis Star as a copy boy. It was a low-paying, low-level job, but Herbert fully committed to it. He was hardworking, but his colleagues described him as being overly eager. He wanted to be told that he was doing a good job, for his co-workers to like him, 
and to feel like he was successful even if he was just a copy boy. Unfortunately, everyone just saw Herbert as being irritating and a tryhard. Defeated and disappointed, Herbert left the Indianapolis Star and began working at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. With this new position, he decided to try on a new hat. Instead of trying to people please, he was going to be more of a dominant force. He came into this position prideful, bossy, and aggressive. This time around, he wanted to be the person that other people looked to for approval. This approach also didn't work. His coworkers could tell that he was trying to be something that he wasn't. It was like he was playing a character, cosplaying as what he believed someone deserving of respect would be. Even though he didn't succeed at winning over his coworkers, he was at least able to stick with this job long term. He remained at this job for 10 years and even received a promotion. However, this all came to an end in 1985 when he was terminated for urinating on a letter addressed to the governor. I know. This incident also helped the company uncover that he was the culprit behind an incident that occurred a few months prior. So a few months prior, there was a scandal where a manager found urine in his desk. They couldn't figure out who did it. They just, you know, it was disturbing. They let it go. But once they found the letter that had been urinated on and they found out that it was Herbert that did it. I don't know how they found out that it was him that did it, but they found out that Herbert did it and they were like, wait a minute. He must also be the person who peed in the manager's desk. Which, sidebar, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when the manager found pee in his desk. Like, what do you even do? It's one thing when you're a teacher finding pee in your desk because, you know, you're around kids, kids do dumb things, but an adult? They didn't even find out that he did it until months later. So it's like, you just got to be on high alert every single day because you work with an undercover R. Kelly. My nerves would have been so bad. Anyway, 1985 was a bad year for Herbert overall. His family took a huge loss after he lost his job. At this point, they had three children and were down to a single income, living paycheck to paycheck. That same year, he was arrested for a hit and run that he committed while driving drunk. Nothing came of it, but it shows that he was not in a good mental state. Oh, also that year, he stole a friend's car and was arrested for that, but he beat those charges too. Besides the criminal stuff, he was also just having trouble finding work. He was bouncing in between jobs, and then he finally landed on a job that he deemed interesting at, at a thrift shop of all places. If you think about it, a thrift shop embodied who Herbert was as a person. You're taking things that people have deemed to be undesirable and trying to polish them into something that someone else will accept. Needless to say, he fell in love with the concept. He borrowed $4,000 from his mother and started a thrift store chain called Save A Lot. It was so successful in the first year that they went to open a second store. Within three years, the family was rich. The success from this was the exact type of success that Herbert always dreamed of. He was the owner of a respected business and that in itself should have been enough for him to garner the respect and acceptance that he had been yearning for. Right? Wrong. He never changed his behavior. He was awful to his employees, often yelling at them and bossing them around. He even had taken to threatening his wife like an employee. These pop up on the screen. I mean, like, that's when my mouth dropped. I was like, oh my gosh. And I started trying to think, okay, when did I work for him? Because that's when I had the year. And I was like, wow, I worked with him while this was happening. Adam Smith was just 15 years old when he worked at one of the Save-A-Lot thrift stores. He said Baumeister micromanaged the employees and his mood could change at any moment. He had a very hands-on role on what he wanted to keep. And he would tell us the, his expectations. And if we did not, if we put something in the pile that we thought 
wasn't good. He would blow up and freak out. Smith says the employees had to sort the used goods that came in each day. He also did the yard work outside of Baumeister's store. It was hot um, that summer, so he did, he did allow me to actually take my shirt off um, to because it was no shade. And I, first week, I think I cut the trees down and, and weeded the whole parking lot. Baumeister is accused of luring LGBTQ men from Indianapolis gay bars to his Westfield home, where authorities say he killed them. Smith says he never felt unsafe with his boss, but often thinks of the amount of time he spent alone with the accused killer when he was a teen. Mouth dropped. First thought was, I'm not totally surprised because he was, when I say, I don't have enough words to describe that he was, um... Short-tempered, eccentric, eccentric, not as in like a rich eccentric, just he was bizarre. His mannerisms, um, the things he got annoyed at and, and frustrated at things that his workers did. They used the money from their business to purchase their estate, Fox Hollow Farms. It was a gorgeous 18-acre ranch in Westfield, Indiana. It had everything, a stable, plenty of rooms, and an indoor pool. It was the kind of house that you would have seen on, like, MTV Cribs. That was, at least, until the Baumeisters moved in. You know how they say that your living space is a reflection of your mental space? This was definitely true for their home. The grounds were filled with weeds, and every single room was cluttered, filled with boxes of items that Herbert did not want to let go of. The only room that seemed to be well maintained was the pool. It was kept clean and maintained, decked out in the most extravagant decor, and had mannequins in various poses. Due to how chaotic the house was and how unpredictable Herbert was, Julie would just leave the house to him for the most part and take the kids to her mother's home. When Julie was away from the home, she just assumed that Herbert was taking care of the business. Little did she know, he was actually using that free time to indulge in his double life. At this time, downtown Indianapolis had a bustling gay community. There was a cluster of gay bars that allowed people to be their true selves away from the watchful and sometimes judgmental eyes of the conservative community. These places offered a safe space for many, but it didn't stay that way for long. There started to be reports of large numbers of men going missing, all having last been seen visiting one of the bars in that area. People began speculating that there was a serial killer on the loose. There were calls to action, but they went largely unheard. The police didn't want to publicize it too much for the risk of scaring the rest of the community. However, this decision caused the gay population to feel as though they were being overlooked because of their sexual preference. Because of this, the mothers of some of the missing men decided to take matters into their own hands. They hired a private investigator, Virgil Vandegrift, to investigate. Vandegrift suspected that they were dealing with a serial killer, likely the same serial killer who was responsible for the I-70 murders that took place from 1989 through the mid-1990s. Gay men who were known to frequent bars in the Ohio and Indianapolis area were turning up strangled to death and left on the side of the highway. Vandegriff got started by distributing posters requesting any information on the missing men. These posters grabbed the attention of Brian Smart. He was a lanky, awkward-looking man that was propped against a wall in a gay club in Indianapolis. His eyes were glued to the missing person's poster. He seemed mesmerized by it. His trance was broken by a man who prefers to be referred to as Tony. Tony could feel that Brian knew more than he let on, so he decided to pick his brain for information. Brian became evasive and seemed uneasy discussing the missing man. They continued to converse throughout the night, and Brian invited Tony to come back with him to his boss's house. Tony wanted to get more information from Brian, so he agreed. They drove up a long, winding driveway. Tony scanned the area, trying to take note of every little detail to provide it to the police. However, it was dark, so he couldn't make out much. All he could see was that it was a secluded, ranch-style Tudor home with a sign out front that read, 
farm something, but he couldn't make out the rest of the words. He followed Smart into the very cluttered home, navigating around boxes and furniture. They walked into the pool area and Tony noticed it was littered with mannequins. When asked about the mannequins, Brian replied with, Hey, my boss doesn't like to be alone. They then got into the pool and Brian asked Tony if he would be okay with being choked. Tony agreed. He recounted that it was obvious that Brian had done the same routine many times before. Brian wrapped a hose around Tony's throat. The pressure was firm but not uncomfortable. Tony felt himself slipping out of consciousness. It was clear that Brian wasn't going to let go, so Tony relaxed his body and played dead. Once Smart released him, he opened his eyes to find Smart obviously surprised that he was still alive. Tony tried to ask Smart if he had ever killed anyone, but Smart ever only mentioned that there had been mishaps or accidents in the past where he got carried away. They got dressed and Brian drove Tony home and made plans to meet again sometime in the future. Once Tony exited the car, he breathed a sigh of relief. He literally just escaped death. He was 100% sure that Brian was the reason for the disappearances. Tony called the number on the missing persons poster from the bar and explained everything to the private investigator, Vandegriff. Vandegriff turned everything over to Mary Wilson with the Indianapolis Police Department. However, there just wasn't enough information to uncover the true identity of Brian Smart. It was clear that he was using a fake name, and Tony's description of the location of the home made it nearly impossible to find. They asked around at bars and provided a description of Brian, hoping for more information. This was also a dead end. Anyone who thought that they had seen someone who matched the description that was provided for Brian all had a different name. A year later, in 1996, they finally received the information they needed. Tony was visiting one of his usual bars in Indianapolis. As he was wading through the crowd, he noticed a familiar face. Brian Smart. He began yelling. Embarrassed, but trying to play it off, Brian left the bar. Tony and a friend followed in an attempt to get Brian's license plate number. Brian tried to evade, but unbeknownst to him, Tony was able to track him down and get his plate number. Tony brought this plate number to Wilson with the police department. She was shocked by what she discovered. The plates didn't lead to some weird, strange loner. It led to a man who would be considered a pillar of society on paper. He was married, wealthy, with three children. Herbert Baumeister. Mary would struggle with how to approach this. If Tony was wrong, this could lead to a very awkward encounter and potentially outing someone who was clearly trying to live a double life in private. All of the evidence that they had at this point was purely circumstantial, so she had to be delicate. She approached Baumeister outside of one of his Save-A-Lot stores. He was terrified. He shook and stuttered as Wilson questioned him about the missing man. Wilson replied by informing Herbert that they had eyewitness reports of his vehicle being reported at gay bars in the area. Herbert retreated but admitted to no wrongdoing. Wilson requested a search of his estate. Herbert declined. Because they only had circumstantial evidence, they couldn't get a warrant through the county. Their only option at this point was to contact his wife, Julie, for permission to search the property. One day, you know, they called me in the back room. The, my cashier called and said, you know, there's two people here to see you. And I walked up front and they identified themselves as being from the Indianapolis Police Department and said that they um, were investigating her for a homosexual homicide. And I cannot begin to tell you the degree of life that left my body at that point. I just went blank and thought, what is homosexual homicide? I was trying to, I can define the word homosexual. I can define homicide. Now, how do you define them together? 
She was pretty upset when we told her it had to do with missing men. I just wanted them to leave so I could cry. And they finally did leave, and I cried. Now, before you guys come for Julie, please understand that she was married to a man who was an expert manipulator and a liar. I know it sounds crazy that she didn't immediately put the pieces together, especially since she found the bones over a year prior to the police contacting her, but we don't know what she was going through. The following six months were very trying for the Baumeister family. Herbert suffered an emotional breakdown, their once successful store was failing, and Julie reached her breaking point. In June of 1996, Julie filed for divorce and contacted her lawyer to tell her lawyer about the bones. Her lawyer advised that she should inform the police and sign off on the search warrant. Julie agreed. On June 24th of 1996, Julie walked three police officers to the grassy area next to her back patio. It was 18 acres of land, so they expected they would have to search for a while before they would be able to find anything. Mere seconds after stepping off the patio, one detective looked down at the rocky area where the Baumeister's children would frequently play and immediately found bone fragments. Bones were literally everywhere. They littered Baumeister's land and even spilled into the neighbors. There were large bones, small fragments, and teeth. It was estimated that the fragments of 11 men were found. Recent numbers put that estimate closer to 25. Herbert disappeared as soon as he heard the news. On July 3rd of 1996, Herbert's body was found in his car in Ontario, Canada. He died by self-inflicted gunshot wound. His suicide note mentioned his failing business and marriage as the reason. He made no mention of the bodies found. Herbert's death left many unanswered questions. Authorities were left to try to put together the pieces. There was a call to action for family members of missing people to come forward to identify the bodies. There are some that are still unidentified 30 years later. There's also concerns that he may have been responsible for the I-70 murders as well. According to Julie, he took many trips to Ohio. Bodies of missing gay men were turning up on the side of I-70 from 1989 up until 1992 when Herbert purchased his home. There was also the unsolved case of Jerry Comer. Jerry Comer was last seen in August of 1995 at a gay bar in Indianapolis. He was never found. Was he a victim of Baumeister as well? I'm interested in hearing what you guys think of this case. I've read a lot of commentary from people judging Julie. How do you feel about the decisions that were made? Leave a comment down below, and if you like this episode, please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe.